2 Corinthians 5, 17 actually is a nugget. It is a core. But I'd like for us to back up a couple of verses to 15 together. And I wanted to read it out of a more dynamic translation. It's called, He Died for Everyone. Everybody say, He Died for Everyone. Aren't you so glad he didn't die for your neighbors all around you, but he skipped you? Aren't you glad he died for everyone? So that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and raised them. That's right. That's what's going to happen. If you have been acknowledging and obeying and you are a participant in this death of Jesus Christ who was raised for you, you can't help but live for Christ. Now watch watch verse verse number 16. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. Well, that's helpful. At one point, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. Does anybody remember when you thought of Christ from a human point of view? He was just a good man. He was just a prophet. How differently we know him now. Woo! (laughs) This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Amen. A new life has begun. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, old things are passed away. All things have become new. Praise God for that. Amen. Everybody say amen. Amen. And you're welcome to take your seat, especially if you've ever struggled with change. I think we've all struggled with change and changing to be right and to be better and to be the person and the man or the woman that God really would have us to be. Change. It's not easy. I read about a mother of five who lives in Illinois, her name is Jeannie, and she, she took her nine-year-old daughter out for a mother-daughter breakfast one day. Nine-year-old, right? Spending a little quality time with her over breakfast. So during the course of the meal, she asked her daughter, she said, how do you think I could be a better, a better mom? How do you think I could be a better mom? Her nine-year-old was quiet for a moment, and then she said, well, you do yell a lot. I know you've been praying about that, but it really isn't working yet. <laughs> Change isn't easy. Maybe you've heard about the, the story. It's kind of almost a proverbial story now from a, about a family from a remote area. They were kind of like hillbillies, I guess we call them. Made their first trip to the big city. Remember that story? They check into the downtown hotel. They're directed to the elevators. Never seen an elevator in their life father and the the son stand there staring at those doors opening and closing and trying to figure out what to do. Remember that story? They watched an elderly, elderly lady move slowly toward the elevator. She pushes a button, the doors open, and this elderly lady gets in, the doors close. And man, it's just a minute or two that go by. And, and then that elevator opens and a smiling young lady walks out of the elevator. Without even looking around, that father patted his son on the shoulder and said, Go get your mother, son. Uh Huh? Boy, if only change would come that easy, right? How many of you would like to get on that elevator? (laughs) It doesn't come easy in behavior. It doesn't come easy in appearance. I want to preach a message today about God's greatest offer, and that is to be transformed. But I want to tell you something. It is, it's not easy on your own. It's not easy to be involved in this sweeping kind of life impacting change. It doesn't come easy in behavior. Hey, it doesn't even come easy in appearance. I mean, you know, people like to shortcut the process of aging and have plastic surgery for a quick change or to go back to what they looked like before. You would think it would be so you know, so effective in what it does, but there's been, not long ago, a study was made by the American Medical Association. They took 49 patients who were photographed before their facelifts and all that stuff, before their brow lifts, chin, tucks, whatever. They took 
pictures before and after. And a group of reviewers examined the faces of the people and determined that those who had been through the procedure, they looked, on average, about three years younger. Big deal, right? But their perceived attractiveness didn't change at all. In other words, total waste of time and effort, unless you're a plastic surgeon. That's a Time Magazine article from a few years ago that made that clear. Change. Everybody say change. Change doesn't come easy, no matter how much money you throw at it. But can I just tell you I have some really good news today that true change, everybody say true change, it is possible, but you have to go about this change God's way. There's only one way, and it is God's way. Hallelujah. I got, I got another scripture that I want us to examine here in just a moment. Each time I pass through the scriptures, I stumble on this passage. It really catches my attention every time I look at it. And, and when I first read it, initially my heart is drawn toward it, and I think, man, someday, someday I'm going to preach that. And so this week, I keep getting drawn back to it. It's found in the chapter of 1 Samuel, where the prophet Samuel anoints a young man. Maybe you remember the story. The prophet Samuel takes the anointing oil, and he goes to the prophet, goes to the tribe of Benjamin, and he anoints a young man named Saul to be the first king of Israel. Remember the story? First king. Everybody say first king. <laughs> In a series of instructions, watch this. First Samuel 10, 5 through 7. One of the things that he tells the prophet, the prophet tells the future king is this. Here's the verse. After that, you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is. And it'll happen. When you've come there to the city, you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute, a harp before them, and they will be prophesying. Verse 6. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them. And what does it say? Let's read it together. And be turned into another man. Yeah. Huh. How many of you wives would sure love for your husband? No, just kidding. You don't have to answer that. <laughs> turned into another man. Uh, have you read the Bible before? Anybody that caught your attention? You'll be turned into another man. That's like the elevator and the old lady, and she comes out a new lady, right? Wow, like if a real could happen, right? You'll be turned into another man. You will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Then verse 7, and let it be when these signs come to you that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. God is using his vessel, his anointed prophet Samuel, to speak to the first king, Saul, and he says these words to him. So, so today, let's talk about God's greatest offer. Be transformed. You can be transformed. You can walk out of here a brand new person in Christ. If you have Christ in your heart, you're already spirit-filled, you can leave here even more so. Everybody can. This is for everyone. No one check out just because it seems like this is old stuff for you. This is new for me, new for you, new for everyone. And I have just a little reluctance in dealing with that scripture about Saul turning into another man because it's just, I have to kind of grit my teeth a little because of the subject and the person. Okay, two things, the subject and the person. The first thing is the subject. Remember the subject? Israel wants a king, and that's a problem. And not just that they want a king, but number two, the person. The person they chose, or that was chosen to be a king. So let's talk about that, that subject for a second. You might recall Israel had been in existence for many years up until this point. And, and Israel, what is Israel? Israel's a person. It's a name God gave who? God gave this guy the name Israel. What was his name? 
Jacob, one of the twin boys born to Isaac and Rebekah. Right now, let's just, it's, I want to get stuck or, or lost in the weeds here, but think about this important point. Israel was born 2,000 years before Jesus Christ, and the story is extremely relevant to us because we're born 2,000 years after Christ. Isn't that interesting? For Jacob, he had a testimony that change is possible. Remember, Jacob was his old name, and then Israel is his new name, the conniver, the deceiver, the swindler. He became a prince before God. It can be done. Israel's small family of 70 souls, they went into Egypt, and they stayed there for four centuries, 400 years under bondage as slaves. Affliction prospered them. It didn't shut them down and make them wither away to nothing. No, it prospered them when they were under affliction. Can I just stop right here and say suffering is a medicine for the proud, and it's a preservative for the righteous. Mark that down. Tweet that if you want. That's a good, good little quote right there, isn't it? When you're going through suffering, you can complain and get all aggrav- aggravated and upset and say you don't deserve it. Or you can say, God, what happened to your people when they went into bondage and they suffered for 400 years? They came out of there 600 men strong. Thank you, sir. They went into the crucible of affliction. Only 70 souls, but they exited millions strong. And then they returned to the promised land 600 years after Israel's birth. If you add all that up, that's 1,000 years, and that's about the time where we find out that their last judge is ruling Israel, and his name is Samuel. Israel now wants a king like the rest of the nations around them. It didn't matter that they had a godly leader in Samuel the prophet. It didn't matter. They wanted to be like everyone else. So that points out a huge problem with humanity in general, not just the people of Israel. It points to you and me. If we're not careful, here's the problem. We will either be transformed from the world around us or we will be conformed to the world around us. Can I just tell you it's the will of God that we be transformed? Transformed. God's greatest offer ever to be transformed. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do you see the root word form? Is in, is, comes in twice there. Comes into play twice, the root word form. We see two words, conform and transform. You'll either be formed or shaped or molded into what the world demands for you to be shaped into, or you're going to say, no, I will be formed in the image of the Lord. You will be formed one way or another. And don't you tell me you're going to be your own independent formation. No, no, no. You're going to either be conformed to the world or you're going to hear a message like this this morning and say, God, I want to be transformed. I want to be like you. I want to be transfigured. I don't want to assimilate, Lord. I want to be transfigured into your image, Lord. Make me like you. I want to be transformed. Everybody say amen. Amen. The Greek word, the Greek word in that, transformed, that word transformed, the Greek for that is the word we get our word metamorphosis from. Metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. What do you think of when you think of the word metamorphosis? Everybody who thought of a butterfly, raise your hand. Change of form. Change of appearance. Change of nature. Change of behavior. He wouldn't say it if it weren't possible. It's possible. Be transformed. Here's the problem. Israel didn't want transformation. They chose assimilation. They wanted to be like those around them. Those people have kings, so we want a king, all right? So this is kind of the reason why I've kind of shied away from this passage of Scripture, and I wanted to nail it down today and let it not 
fly out of my hand this morning. I wanted to bring it to your attention that, that this is, there's something about this that is extremely displeasing to the Lord. The prophet Samuel, given to God as a child, the last judge, he's raised in the house of God. He's devoted to God, but so sad, just like Eli, Samuel was a failure as a father, and he offered his profane sons to Israel as leaders. Israel said, "Mm mm-mm, we want a king instead. Samuel's feelings were hurt, and he prayed, and God said, hey, relax. They have not rejected you. They have rejected me. Give them a king. So here's here's the summary. For a thousand years of Israel's history, a thousand years, God had been their king. Now they wanted a man to rule over them. That's, that's the first reason that this, this scripture has to be as a little unwieldy, but we gotta, we got to grab a hold of it and say, they wanted to assimilate and not be transformed. That was the problem. And then, then there's this issue with the king himself. It's the second reason this passage has a little difficulty. It's because of Saul. Now, of course, Saul was head and shoulders taller than any man in Israel, but he was backwards. On coronation day, the day to crown him the king, you know where he is? Hiding among the stuff, the Bible says. Hiding among the baggage, hiding among the possessions, wherever. And so there's a certain backward tendency to Saul we see throughout his sad life. David... (laughs) Check this contrast out. David watched his father's sheep. Saul watched his father's donkeys. Hmm. So David had the nature of sheep, didn't he? (laughs) Saul watched his dad's donkeys and behaved like one. Stubborn, lashing out, unpredictable. So, without going into the details of why and how Saul was chosen, I just want to dive right in and tell you that he was chasing his father's donkeys, and it happened that he landed in the house of God in Ramah, where Samuel lived. God had told Samuel a little before, I'm going to send a young man from the tribe of Benjamin, and you're going to anoint him to be king over Israel. So Samuel saw Saul and said, Hey, buddy, don't worry about your father's donkeys. They've been found. Come sacrifice with me, and I will tell you all that is in your heart. So Saul is like, who, me? Me, really? I, I'm, I'm nobody. I'm just a Benjamite of the smallest tribe. And Hey, my family's the least of all the families of the smallest tribe, so why in the world are you speaking so kindly to me? He needed to be exalted and lifted up in his own eyes for some reason, so Samuel brought Saul into a hall filled with people and placed him in a position of honor, He instructed the cook, give this man Saul the choicest of meats. And later that day, they sacrificed. And then early the next morning, Samuel called Saul and said, Saul, stand here and let me announce to you the word of God. And at that moment, Samuel poured from a flask of oil right out onto Saul's head. And it dripped down into his beard and into his garments. And here's what Samuel said, God has anointed you commander over his inheritance. (laughs) And I think Samuel is like looking at Saul and he's like, man, this guy needs a little more confidence in what I'm saying. So he says, okay, I'm going to bolster this confidence and tell him some things that are going to happen so he'll know how true this is. So he says, watch this, you'll you'll be met by two men near Rachel's tomb and and they're going to tell you the donkeys were found but your father's worried about you. That's number one. Number two, you're going to come to an oak tree in Tabor, and you'll see three men going to worship at Bethel, and each of them will be carrying a particular instrument, right, a particular thing. And then in the third thing, he says, you'll come to a hill of God, and once you enter the city, you'll be met by a group of prophets coming down from a high place, and they're going to all be playing musical instruments. How many things do you need before God proves that he's really calling you to be the king of Israel? Well, for some reason, there's a point that, that Samuel makes. He says, there's not, that's not all. There's a fourth thing. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, Saul, 
and you too will prophesy, and you will be turned into another man. So there you have it. Here, here we are quick to fast forward to the end of King Saul's life on Mount Gilboa. He's a rebellious man. He's jealous and vindictive, more willing to consult a sorcerer. I'm skipping so many things, and it's an interesting study, but he's a failure as a father. He destroys his three sons in his own rebellion, on and on and on. Such a sad, tragic story. But I am saying, Lord, help me begin to think differently of this passage of Scripture. Here it is. Not that God wasted his spirit on this man, Saul. No, no, no. But that God was for him and not against him. God was in his favor. God was the one who said, I am going to give you all that you need to be the king. You are going to be given everything that could possibly be given. You're actually going to let my spirit turn you into another man if you will be so willing. Uh, You're going to turn. That's what he said. You will be turned into another man. God was giving Saul, regardless of the outcome, an incredible opportunity just like he's giving every one of us an incredible opportunity to be turned into another individual. Praise God for his promise. Folks, can I, can I just tell you that God is a God who knows how, and he does keep his word. Now, I just need to do a quick little sidebar here and tell you, I don't mean to single out one problem over others. Each of us, oh my goodness, we're all prone to one form of failure or another. I know. And we tend, as we're born, to be predisposed to one weakness, one area of baggage, or one sin than another. But let me mention something to those who struggle with alcoholism today. Difficult to change. Difficult to come out of alcoholism. I could go into so many other vices, but let me just tell you, I read something recently by Chuck Colson before he died. He he wrote these words. Seattle, Washington has a downtown emergency service center. And the city of Seattle spent millions of dollars on permanent housing for homeless alcoholics. Now listen, this is an important message right here. You may not be struggling with alcoholism today, but the message is so powerful and true. They had been spending... $50,000 per homeless alcoholic on recovery programs, health care, jails, and so forth. So here's their solution. Now let's build 1811 Eastlake. It's a housing complex that holds 75 alcoholics. They are allowed to drink. Here's what it says. They are allowed to drink all they want as long as they stay off the streets. And here's the philosophy of the program director. Once you're an alcoholic, you're always an alcoholic. What a way to deal with the problem. Now, that's unfortunately the sentiment of far too many people. It's pretty much admitted by recovery programs, the most famous being Alcoholics Anonymous. And they love to say, you're always an alcoholic. And their founder, even their founder had this to boast. Here's what what Mr. William Wilson said. Rarely have I seen a person fail who's thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are those who cannot or will not give themselves completely to this simple program. Usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunates. They are not at fault. They seem to be born that way. That's in his book. The founder of AA. So sad that he himself struggled with addictions until the day he died. One author noted that he chain smoked until he died. Went from one extramarital affair after another and then experimented with drugs. So I'm just here to tell you, brothers and sisters, change doesn't come easy. But change is possible. You can change. 
I can change. Lord God, help us. I, I don't know about you, but I have read of statistics of people who literally do simply come to grips with the fact that they have a drinking problem and they stop. They have nothing more than willpower to conquer it and they do their best and they end up doing a pretty good job and, and you know, at least short term, they can make it. And, and once in a while, you come across someone who literally has been able to let go of it. But can I tell you here this morning that God has placed in, inside each of us a will. And I believe by nature he's, in, he's given us an instructive grace inside to guide us to correct choices if we will listen and if we will hear and obey. Now, I grant you that the spirit of men and women may be willing, but my goodness, the flesh is weak. We have the power to change. There is a power that is available I'm just going to quote one of my favorite leadership writers named John Maxwell. Listen to what he said. People change when they hurt enough that they have to, learn enough that they want to, or receive enough that they're able to. Hurt enough they have to, learn enough they want to, or receive enough they're able to. Now, I think that that latter part really is the part I want to narrow down on. Hurting people can change when they receive enough to enable them to change. That is exactly what Samuel was telling Saul. I believe the spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will become another man was the message that you're going to receive enough to enable you to change. <laughs> you will be a new man. You'll be another man. You will be another man. Now, what hope is found? I'm going to tell you that, that I really am starting to thank God for that scripture. That passage of scripture says you will be a new man. You will become another man. Change doesn't come easy, but change is possible. I've got to just tell you right now, let's focus in right now. What doesn't come easy to the flesh because it's weak is made possible by the spirit of almighty God. And God's spirit is in this house today. God's spirit of solutions, his spirit of transformation, his spirit of help is in here today. Jesus said we would receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon us. Aren't you glad that Jesus said that? Jesus said you would receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Paul said we would be strengthened with the spiritual might in the inner man because of the Holy Ghost. When we don't know how to pray like we should, what does the Bible say? The Spirit of God prompts us, enables us to pray. Now, folks, I'm so excited about this next little part right here. I wish I had time to permit everyone in this room to share personal experiences, to share testimonies of how change proved possible, how change proved possible, but only after the Holy Ghost entered your life then it really enabled you to change. Folks, change proves impossible to so many people. And I'll tell you, it's because they need to hear God's word and they need to be aware of the love of Jesus Christ and his availability to turn a life around that is headed down a dead end and headed over a cliff, perhaps over a waterfall to never come back. But when you get a hold of the word of the Lord, he helps you to turn around the circumstance and changes you into a new man. I mean, here we have, in this room, we have a story of four and five pack a day smokers who would never dream of a day that they could cut down to one pack, less, much less quit. <laughs> Woo! But when the Spirit of the Lord entered their lives, their desire changed. Cravings altered. Some walked entirely away. Some one cigarette at a time. But I'm here to tell you, God's spirit is able to help us to get sick and tired of this world and get sick and tired of the things that destroy and the, the things that cause us disease and contamination. I thank God. I'm a, I'm a grant that a recovery and support group just might help, but the Spirit of God is so far superior and able to transform a person who craves alcohol and feels he must have it to get by. 
Hey, did you guys ever know alcohol is sometimes called spirits? Definitely not higher, a lower, uh, uppercase, right? Definitely not uppercase. Spirits. So in, it's because in a way, it's an imitation for the spirit of God. I believe that. A substitute for the spirit of God. Paul said not to be drunk on spirits. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you ever thought of that before? Don't be drunk on wine, wherein, as I said, don't be drunk on spirits. But he said, be filled with the spirit. The Holy Spirit can vanquish your desire for lesser spirits and put you on a path to complete victory over the addictions and the issues of your past. Praise God. I, I, I sent out a random text to a few folks that I knew were spirit-filled later in life, and I, and I got some incredible responses back from individuals that, that I'm going to read to you here. That their testimonies personally not even altered. I just basically put them in here as their text messages. Sister Ramona Miley, I said, Sister Ramona, I'd like for you to tell me about what happened and how different you are after you received the Holy Ghost. I, I, I asked Pamela Chalinski, I asked Shane Gibson, I asked, I asked Sean Robertson, I asked Layla Bradshaw, Bobby Bradshaw, I asked Autumn Alvarez, and I asked Steve Lloyd, and I asked Aaron Bates, and I asked Chris Isom, and several others, and if we went to, through all of them, we would all have to be calling in DoorDash for lunch. So we're not gonna do that but I just want to share a little snippet of the things that God has done for his people. And this is not just a theory. I'm not preaching just a good idea today. I'm not messaging you today with just something that is a really inspiring thought. No, no, no. This is not just inspiration, folks. This is transformation. This is what sets the apostolic Pentecostal church separate and apart from any other church that does not preach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and the baptism in his name and the infilling of the gift of the Holy Ghost. Can you help me thank him for the infilling of the Spirit? Woo! Ramona said, it's like a light bulb went on in my mind. Soul, she said, went on in my soul. She said, I became very aware of sin that I really considered more like bad habits, white lies, not really bad. I started changing like all the crooked things in my life started becoming straight. I slowly started becoming honest and stopped trying to hide who I really am. I really had self-hatred. And Sister Ramona, you're here today. Lifting hands to a mighty God, knowing Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Shane Gibson, he said, I guess the best way I could sum it up is the Lord gave me an insight on how life could be. That so, so, it was so that I, it was a, an insight that I never knew was possible. The world I grew up in was that life was awful and it never really got better. You just try to manage with small worldly pleasures and entertainment. I came from divorced parents. My dad went to prison when I was 12. And that's how I thought life was supposed to be. Only lucky people had better lives. But listen to what Shane says. God blessed me with a loving wife and a marriage of 24 years, two God-living children, and a 23-year career in IT. I did not know that prayer works and God promises were real until I received the Spirit. Capital S. Woo! Thank you, Brother Gibson. Hallelujah. 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 Sean and Maria Robinson. Sean wrote this. I, my wife and I were going to Bible study church for about a year before I was baptized. It was another year after that I, before I received the Holy Ghost. Before that, during that time, God was making changes in my life and directing me where he wanted me. It wasn't until after I got the Holy Ghost that I could really hear his voice and more clearly understand what he was trying to do in my life. I no longer felt alone, and I felt I had the power now to make changes I couldn't before on my own. Thank you, Brother Sean. And he says, my growth became exponential. Praise God. Hey, is anybody interested in something that is not just a fable? I'm not selling. I'm not peddling. This is not snake oil, folks. This right here is the power of the gospel that we understand 2,000 years ago preached. 
Hallelujah. Sister Layla said, I received the Holy Spirit at the age of 15. God gave me discernment most of all. Understanding his word became a lot easier, and I started seeing things I didn't see before. I also noticed being led and empowered by the Spirit. And then her better half, right? Bobby Bradshaw. Who's the better half? I'll let them fight that out, all right? Here's what Brother Bobby said. The Holy Spirit transformed me through the power, the confidence to stand up and proclaim him. You've got to hear this, what Brother Bobby said. To walk in his statutes, whereas before I was a Trinitarian, without the Spirit, I'd struggle to go an hour without stumbling or sinning. He has given me much more insight into life and relationships that I would not have been able to properly handle before. He has shown me many things in his word that now has effectiveness and life. Instead of a powerless and empty regurgitation of verses and academic sounding theology, which I had before. Praise God. (laughs) Amen. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Sister Autumn Alvarez, Sister Autumn, thank you so much for writing this. I'm so glad I have all these text messages because we, we have some wonderful, wonderful Acts 29 material here. She said in Easter of 2016, we started coming to church at Calvary Apostolic Church of Denver. We were worldly and backslid from my Baptist and Catholic roots. This church was unlike anything I'd ever experienced. I was used to quiet prayer, no movement of Christ through the service, I had never cried while praying before. It felt good, like home. We knew right away this was our home. In the beginning, we loved church, but we were still unsure and uncommitted. We had one foot in the door and one foot out. By our third service, things were starting to set in, and the Spirit was growing in my heart. And then one day, I made the decision. I packed up all my makeup, all my jewelry, and tossed it all, Then I cleared out my whole closet. When my husband came home from work, he found me bagging up all my worldly clothes, and he said, what are you doing? I replied, I'm getting rid of everything I don't need. Well, Franklin thought it was a phase. Little did he know that I would move on to the rest of the house, removing everything that would or could become any form of stumbling block. (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) Isn't that awesome? She says, shortly after I received the Holy Ghost and was baptized in Jesus' name, going on to our sixth year as first-generation apostolics, myself, my husband, and my son, we've all been baptized in Jesus' name. And we praise God for that, don't we, Sister Autumn? Woo! (laughs) Oh, my goodness, I know. Yeah, yeah, we could could, could, uh, could just keep going and going. Brother Steve Lloyd, Brother Lloyd... You're sitting here all dressed prim and proper. i got to read yours. Here's the way it starts. Okay. (laughs) My life 15 years ago seemed to be surrounded by intractable problems, both personal and business. I was left with only the only option of taking one day at a time and hoping for the best. My spiritual life, as it was, was showing itself to be very inadequate in moving me or my spirit in a positive direction. I turned to my friend and business customer out of desperation. After several weeks and many helpful interventions in my troubles, it became obvious that the only common denominator in my issues was me. When I asked to be baptized, it was a great relief to acknowledge that my only possible solution was to get hooked up with Jesus. It was a glorious revelation. When I first spoke in tongues a week before I was baptized, I was totally fixated on Jesus. And that has made all the difference. (laughs) And there's a little bit more, but I'm going to see if I can figure out a little bit about Brother Chris Isom. He says, when I received the Holy Ghost, he removed all the doubt that he'd been piling up in my mind. I had been piling up in my mind. He let me know that he really loved me individually. Thank you, Brother Chris. He said, it brought such joy and peace and let me know he had a purpose for me. And from that point on, I know there really is a God. I have not doubted that ever since. Thank God. And how many of you know we could go on and 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 fill the day? Amen? Y'all know that, right? Folks, but I want to tell you something right now. 
That, those people right there that I have just read about, they, they are an example that what God has done for them, he is no respecter of persons. And he is not a person who focuses on any particular gender, any race, or any socioeconomic status. Our God is a God who says, I can put to rest every issue in your life if you will be filled with the Spirit. Hallelujah. I thank God for this incredible, beautiful word of the Lord today that his greatest offer ever is be transformed. Be transformed. And here is the way God spoke it to Ezekiel. He told Saul, you will be turned into another man. But listen, (laughs) I think every one of those testimonies and the ones I didn't even get to, they can stand up here with me and say, the things I once loved, I don't love them anymore. The one things I once hated, I no longer hate. Can I just sum it up by looking at what Jesus, God Almighty, Jehovah himself said to Ezekiel in 36, 26. Let's look at it together. I will give you a new heart. Could anybody use a new heart? And he said, I could, I'll put a new spirit within you. Ooh, hallelujah. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Everybody read verse number 27. What does he say? I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Folks, when he has put his spirit in you, suddenly the old nature is gone and the new nature is to do according to and to think and to decide and to relate according to the power of the Lord's amazing word. I believe the word of God is clear enough today for me to say someone here today needs to say, okay, I am done, I am ready, I want to be transformed. And this is your day, this is your message. I would say, why not today? Why not this morning? And even though you've had transformation experience before, why not say, God, I want you to deepen it a little bit. I want you to pack it a little more into my spirit. I want you to make me even more like you. As we stand together, as we stand together, there's, there's a gentleman who was born blind from childhood, blind. In 50 years of blindness, this man underwent a revolutionary surgery that gave him the gift of sight. Woo! He woke up from that surgery and he could see. But what he and his doctor discovered was that having the physical capacity to see is not the same as seeing the world around us. This guy, his first experiences with colors and movements made him so confused. He didn't know that those words for 50 years were those colors and that those words for 50 years were those objects. It was a transformation that had to come upon him after he was able to see. He learned over time to begin identifying objects But here's the deal. His habits and his behaviors, his thinking, was still that of a blind man, even though he had physical sight. Writing about that understanding, the neurologist said, read these words, one must die as a blind person to be born again as a seeing person. He says in the interim, that is the part, that limbo, that is so terrible. Folks, today, this change that I'm talking about, it's not skin deep. It's not a Sunday experience. It's not a happy little family reunion feeling. No, no, no. One must die as a blind person in order to be born again as a seeing person. 
That is why Jesus said so clearly, you must be born again. You must be born again of water and of the Spirit. You can then and only then really change. Then and only then can you really be transformed. We must then live in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit. So today, my last word is this, brothers and sisters, friends. We must be yielded right now to the Word of the Lord and the Spirit of God.